Okay. All right. Thanks for coming back. Uh, always a good sign. Okay. So in this last part of the afternoon, with the last remaining awake neurons that we have, um, we're going to go over a first a, a kind of a case study uh, to show um, a full genome analysis uh, from start to finish at a high level, just to talk about how you structure an, uh, an analysis like that and what are the kinds of challenges uh, that might um, come up that you need to uh, deal with. Um, and so we've got this particular case study as an example, which is, uh, it's something that we did uh, last year because we wanted to show how do you reproduce an analysis that has been published. Um, a lot of us, a lot of the time, uh, need to build on somebody else's work. Like, very little gets done in a vacuum. Um, so we often need to build on, on, on some research that has been uh, done previously. And sometimes you want to use a method that was developed by somebody else, or you want to understand how somebody got the results that they did. Maybe you want to apply their method to your, your own uh, work. And the first step to doing that is reproducing their analysis. And that involves, um, based on the published information, trying to use the tools that they used um, and, and see if you can get that working. And it, we know, uh, anecdotally, that that is one of the steps where people tend to have a lot of trouble um, this really getting other people's tools to work on your own systems and so on. So we wanted to do a little case study of what that looks like. And at the same time, it's kind of a nice illustration of um, a full uh, variant analysis with GHK. So I'm going to walk you through that. Um, if we have time at the end, I also want to, to show you a few uh, additional, kind of give you a brief orientation to the Terra platform, which we've talked about a few times. And again, it's really from the perspective that it is the platform that we use to share our pipelines. And so we want to equip you with uh, enough information that you can go in and see when we have new pipelines, that you can test them out, even if you're not going to use the platform for your own research, um, that you can use it at least for, for trying out uh, the GHK tools in a way that is a lot easier than um, getting the pipelines working on your own system before you even know if that's what you want to use. Okay, but let's focus on this uh, case study first. Um, is my clicker? Is it? Ah, oh, thank you. It was hidden from me. Okay, so the, the study, um, the paper itself, Originally, when we started working on it, um, it was a preprint in BioArchive. Uh, and by the time we finished, they uh, had actually published it. It had been accepted in circulation research. And so it's a paper that does a pretty standard analysis um, of exome data. So they looked at um, exome data from patients who have a particular type of cardiovascular disease, a congenital heart disease called Tetralogy of Fellow. Um, I'll say a word about that in a few minutes. Uh, and they were looking at the uh, patients who have this, um, this disease, uh, as well as a cohort of healthy people um, to compare against. And the idea was to try to identify uh, risk factors for the disease. Like, can we identify one or more genes that are, have more, more variants that you might expect um, <coughs> random uh, that are associated with people who have the disease uh, versus not? So that's a very common thing that people want to do. Um, and so that's why we, that's in part why we chose to look at that paper in particular. Uh, there's also the somewhat coincidental fact that uh, we knew one of the researchers, um, Mathieu Miasek, was one of the uh, main authors, lead authors on the paper. 
Um, and we were scheduled to do a workshop together at a conference. And so we decided that for this case study, we would work on his paper. Okay. And so he helped us. He helped us basically reproduce their entire analysis. Um, in, at the time, our platform was called FireCloud. Now it's Terra. But basically, we reproduced the entire thing. Uh, and we ran into a number of challenges, and I'll walk you through uh, that. But first, what is Tetralogy of Fellow exactly? What are we talking about? Um, like I said, it's congenital heart disease, and it uh, manifests as uh, four kind of a combination of four defects that ultimately um, uh, the consequence is that the Oxi the, the blood that's flowing out of the heart that's being pumped to the body is um, oxygen poor. And so that obviously has a number of consequences for the person, for the patient. Um, so that was the, uh, the, the disease they were looking at. And it had already been, uh, there had already been some analysis done on, on people with that disease and there were a few uh, risk factors that had been identified, but uh, this was the first time, this particular study was the first time they were looking at a, a fairly large number of samples. And so they were looking, if I recall correctly, there we go. Um, they had over 800 patients um, that were identified, uh, diagnosed with this disease that were recruited. Um, there were some exclusion factors, including if they had a particular deletion that had already been identified. Uh, which they wanted to um, uh, exclude since they were looking for new things. Um, and to compare this cohort of 867 patients, they had available over 1,200 individuals who were uh, otherwise uh, seemingly healthy and who were ser serving as controls. So 800 some cases, 1,200 controls uh, from a variety of origins. Uh, so that's the data they were working with. Now, the, this is the analysis um, that they, they built. And this is, this is what they did originally. And this is what we reconstructed based on the information on the preprint. In the preprint is what's on this page. So we had some number of uh, exomes. So they had exomes from all the people uh, I mentioned. Um, we had the technical kind of profiled technical equipment that was used for the sequencing, um, the library preparation. Then from that data, uh, there's a first processing part. And it, we can generally distinguish, in this kind of analysis, we kind of distinguish the processing parts and the analysis proper. And by processing, I mean all the work that gets done uh, in a, in a mostly automated way that is wrote, that is done in the same way pretty much for every study. Uh, and we're distinguishing that from the analysis proper, which is kind of the tertiary analysis, which is the, uh, in a way, interesting part where you're actually asking a scientific question and probing the data. And so that first part of processing, which, which includes kind of the GATK uh, side of the world, um, they were doing that with a, an existing pipeline that was in place at um, McGill University um, in Canada. Um, and this is a pipeline that includes uh, quality trimming, by the way, that included BWA as the aligner, uh, aligned against B37, which is um, an older reference, and GHK version 3, uh, with haplotype colors being the, the main tool that was involved. Um, that, that, that's how it was identified in the paper. Uh, now, I will disclaim that this is technically the pipeline is not what we call GHK best practices in the sense that their implementation was a bit different um, from some of our more recent recommendations. This was a slightly older pipeline. Um, but it's very representative of... of um, pipeline implementations we see out in the wild. And so this is something that's perfectly reasonable to do. Okay. Um, so they followed the main 
GATK recommendations for variant calling. And then uh, having produced a variant call set, uh, you get to the kind of the real analysis. Um, and in this case, they were doing kind of two steps, effect prediction and then the variant load analysis. The effect prediction is basically saying, okay, for every variance that we've identified at this point, we're like, we believe that this is a likely variant and not an artifact. Um, what is it, what do we expect the effect to be in terms of, is it a synonymous mutation and we don't expect any effect, or is it a non-synonymous mutation, it changes the amino acids, or is it, um, is it a nonsense mutation where suddenly we're going to interrupt the production of the protein? There, there's a various different types of effects. And so that's the first step is just to annotate based on a number of different databases, um, annotate the, the actual uh, likely effect of a particular variant. And then also once you have that, you can you do a, a variant load analysis and the clustering analysis where you look at um, can we identify uh, specific genes where we have an accumulation across all patients and co compared to the, the, the control samples, can we identify s certain genes where we see more, um, more variants that have a, a deleterious effect uh, accumulating in the patients compared to the uh, control samples. And so there we had the information about the tools that they used um, to do that, plus some summary information about the databases and reference materials that they were using. So that's the overall analysis that we had. Um, and typically the way you implement something like that is that uh, or the way we recommend implementing this is uh, the processing step is going to be one or more workflows that are just like automated pipeline where you process everything um, in the same way in a very repetitive way. The effect prediction can also be um, implemented as a pipeline like that where there's uh, some number of steps that you do to the data. Um, and then the variant load analysis, that's a bit different. Typically, that's something you want to do interactively where you're probing the data, you're applying certain analyses, producing tables, sometimes making decisions about your next step kind of as you go. Um, so that's what we needed to reproduce. So now I'm going to show you how we uh, re-implemented that. Ideally, what we would do is take the same data, put it through the GTK best practices analysis pipeline, and then uh, replicate what they did, reproduce what they did for the effect prediction and variant load analysis. And at this, at this stage, I will make a note about, like when, if you're reproducing somebody else's work, when do you need to do it exactly the same way? And when can you take a few liberties? Right, because if you change some of the, the details, you might not get the same exact results out anymore. Um, but sometimes there's, so ideally you want to do exactly the same thing, but sometimes there's uh, some reasons why it's too difficult or it's too much of a problem to do exactly the same thing. And so you'll take a few liberties. For example, we took some liberties when we re implemented this, we decided to just use the latest version of GHK, which was GHK 4 point something or other, it doesn't matter. Um, whereas they had been working with a much older version of GHK. And we decided that um, we would take the risk of using a different version of GHK and we would see uh, if we had a problem, we could always go back and reprocess that. But in this case, using a, a later version that was going to be faster, more accurate, and so on, felt like a reasonable compromise. Um, it also allowed us to take advantage of pipelines that we already had implemented, as opposed to having to rewrite something with an older version. Um, 
whereas for the downstream analysis, the, the tertiary analysis there, we felt it was a lot more important to do it exactly the way they had originally. Um, and part of the reasoning is that within a single, uh, within a single study, you should be able to change some of the parameters of variant calling and still pull out biologically the same, um, the same results. If you don't, <laughs> it, there's probably a problem somewhere. Um, but you should be able to change a few things. Now, you don't want to change any of those parameters within the same study. So you definitely wouldn't want to have your cases and controls run through different pipelines because then that's, you know, uh, almost guaranteed batch effects. But if you're applying everything the same way, you can give yourself that uh, freedom. So uh, we applied our latest GATK pipeline. We wanted to apply our latest GATK pipeline to their data and then reproduce exactly their analysis uh, because that was a little bit easier to just take the, the versions that they indicated for that software and re-implement exactly the commands that they had run. Um, there was one problem though which is that the exome sequence data was all access restricted. Um, and we could not, we, we asked if for, even for testing, we could get access to the data, but it was, um, you know, when you're working with human data, that's one of the, the drawbacks is that in many cases, uh, if the data is not consented uh, for that, or if the um, investigators uh, uh, have reasons to restrict access, you just can't access the original data. And that is a very common problem when you're trying to reproduce somebody else's analysis. In human genomics, a lot of the time, the original data is just not shareable, not accessible, uh, especially read data. It's a little ironic that the, technically, the, the raw DNA data is not considered like legally, it's not considered personally identifiable, personally identifying information. Um, it's not covered by uh, those rules, but it is uh, most of the time covered by some kind of restriction on the data set. So we couldn't have access to the data. What were we going to do? Like, what do you do in a case like that? <laughs> Ask the researchers. Yeah, that, that was not an option in this case. Because part of our goal was to make a public workspace, recapitulating the entire uh, study. Yeah. You could do that, but you, you need those researchers to be willing to redo their work. Simulate if you can, yes. So that's actually what we ended up doing. Um, we ended up creating synthetic data uh, to produce equivalent data to reproduce the study. Um, there are uh, programs that you can use to just make fake data, simulate uh, read data, and then there's another one that you can use to introduce variants of interest. So what we ended up doing, without going too much into detail, um, was creating uh, a number of uh, synthetic exomes, and introducing in a subset of them that we considered the case samples, we introduced the variants that had originally been discovered. Um, and so that gave us data that we could run on to at least see if using their tooling, we could pull those things out. Now, obviously, there's a completely circular logic in the fact that we put those variants in, so if we pulled, pulled them out, we haven't proven anything about the biology of the disease. Like, let's be clear on that. But it allows us to test the plumbing of all the tooling that's involved. What did you use for the simulation? So for the simulation, we uh, used a toolkit called NEAT, N-E-A-T. Uh, NEAT uh, GenReads, I think, is the, the full name. Um, and I'll show you the workspace uh, and so you can have access to those tools. So we um, wrote a set of workflows that generated the synthetic data um, and then spiked in the variants. Uh, and the uh, program for that is called uh, BAM Surgeon. Um, and so at that point, we had fake data that we considered was good enough 
to reproduce it. Um, now, because that gave us uh, data that was already, it was already a BAM file ready for analysis, we didn't do the, the pre-processing, um, and we went straight to variant calling uh, uh, from the top of this column, the germline variant calling. Did that for each sample, then called variants across the cohort, uh, calling the case and control samples all together, so in the joint calling. Um, then once we had that, we did the filtering and then the effect prediction um, and variant code analysis as written by the original authors. So, oh yeah, and those are, those are the, the workflows that we wrote to, to actually get the synthetic data. If we have time towards the end, I'm happy to talk a bit more about the synthetic data generation, because I think it is, um, and actually we'll talk more about it on, on uh, Friday. That'll be part of the mini hackathon we'll work, will be, will involve working with these, um, this tooling. So I've shown you the, the kind of the mapping of the how we conceive the analysis. Um, now what I'm going to show you is what that looks like in practice uh, using Terra just uh, as a way to um, show you what are the workflows and uh, what the succession of steps, what it takes to do it in practice. Okay. Um, I forget what the CADD is. It's, it's one it's of the parameters. A score to determine how the previous uh, um, mm. gradient is. Yeah. It's not specific to cardiovascular. It's um, it's a score that's calculated as part of the analysis to determine whether the variant is. It, it's it's kind of one of the things that you use the variant effect prediction for. Um, it's saying based on the predicted effect, uh, we score how likely this is to have a, a negative impact. Um, and so, because you want to only look at uh, genes that are likely to have some negative effect. Oh, uh, yeah. On the protein that's formed. Yeah. Um, so we want to see if that mutation, how that mutation be present, but it doesn't really affect the protein mm -hmm. that's formed. So we want to make sure we only predict the variants that have that Yeah, it's it's basically a filter for, for the pathogenicity of the of the mutations to prioritize which ones you look at. Any other questions about the, the overall design? Oh, okay. All right, so this is what it looks like when you get to is it is the font big enough or should I increase maybe a bit? Uh, that's good. Or oh, is this good? One smaller. Yeah. That okay. Oh, otherwise it's a little scrunched. Okay. All right. So this is what the 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 entry uh, into the platforms look platform looks like. Um, I'm going to show you some examples, and actually the case study that I'm talking about is in the uh, examples. Um, this is built on top of Google Cloud, and we use Google uh, accounts for uh, authentication. And so you need to have a Google account to log in. Now, if you don't have a Gmail address or a Google associated account, you can use your existing email address to create an account. Um, and there's a, a little thing that can. Uh, huh? Oh yeah. Fair points. I think this is. Huh? Oh yeah. Oh. Oh yes, yes. Okay. Thank you. That's why you should always have an engineer with you. <laughs> okay. Um, is the size right or do I need to? Okay, cool. Uh, all right. We'll get through this. Um,
This is my demo account. I remember. Uh, what, oh gosh, different keyboard. I don't understand what it's saying. Did it not recognize? Uh, oh, it's yeah. Oh, okay, it's better. Okay, we're in. All right. Um, so you'll notice uh, this is first uh, time I log in with this particular uh, Google account. I was saving it for you guys. Um, you can see that when you, and the reason I'm showing you this is because I want you to do it at some point tomorrow morning, uh, tomorrow morning. so that's why I'm showing it to you now, uh, because we're going to do all the practicals uh, in Jupyter Notebooks on Terra. And so when you, so I'm going to need you to log in tomorrow morning and do the start trial thing. So this will give you $300 worth of compute and storage credits to use. And we will not use even a fraction of that during a workshop. So after that, you're more than welcome to spend it. It's Google's money, so go ahead and spend it. Um, you can do a start trial, and that will make the... Uh, oh, it's just ask me. Okay, um, that'll make the credits available to you, and you'll be able to um, uh, use it. Then you can hide the banner if you don't want it taking up a whole bunch of space at the top. Uh, okay. All right. So now you have a new account. You have it provisioned with money to play with. Um, you can actually. And you can even before that uh, go through and look at the showcase if you want, but now you can actually do something. So this is a, a showcase of some example workspaces. And the one I'm going to show you directly is the one in which we did the case study and where we set up all of the workflows in the Jupyter Notebook that are involved. And so this workspace recapitulates kind of what I told you um, uh, just before this of how the study was conceived and the fact that we uh, reproduced it within the platform, okay? And it explains kind of what, what went into the design. What I'm going to do now is that I'm going to clone this workspace, which is going to allow me to run some of the workflows. Right now, I'm in the, I'm in the showcase workspace. It's locked and I can't do anything inside of it. I can't modify anything. So I'm going to clone it and uh, I'm going to give it a different name that is unique to me. Um, I'm going to select a billing project. That's how you select who's going to pay for any new work that you do. Um, by default, when you get the free credits, you'll get one of these uh, billing projects assigned to you. That's yours to spend as you like uh, within the platform. And the rest, uh, you don't need to do anything about it. I'm just going to add a note to myself because I do a lot of these. All right. So I clone the workspace. Um, it's going to make a copy of everything in the workspace. So the methods, the configurations, all of that is going to uh, exist in my new clone. And this is, this is now the, the new clone. Um, and in this, I can do anything I want. It's my playground. Okay. <clears throat> um, I'm going to show you first the data. Uh, the data tab is where you set up the data you're working with. Here, we um, set up in the, this particular workspace a hundred of the people for whom we uh, generated fake data. So we're actually starting from 1,000 genomes data. Uh, and, and I can go into that for anybody who's interested. Basically, we have participants from the Thousand Genomes Project from which we took the VCF call sets and then generated fake read data based on that. So we have realistic exomes um, that correspond to originally real people, but it's uh, fake reads. And then into that, we spiked in the, uh, the variants of interest. 
Um, so the mute synth exome BAM that you see uh, up here in this column, that is the BAM file that is ready for analysis that we can start with. And I'm going to restrict the number of columns that are showing because there's a bunch of uh, intermediate files that are contained here. So I'm going to show you just the exome BAM and the GBCF. Uh, the role. And so here on the, on the right side, you see that we've identified uh, case samples and neutral list control, basically. Um, because in the samples we used as controls, we also spiked in a neutral mutation so that everything would be processed the same way. It's just the cases have one of the variants from the study and the controls have a neutral synonymous mutation that was chosen arbitrarily. So all of these, this is the data. Uh, these are pointers to the data uh, uh, where it lives originally. So all of the files that are shown here actually live in a Google buckets. Google bucket, it, the buckets thing is, is how Google calls like units of storage for its um, file storage system. And so you can actually see if you wanted, you could follow that link through to see the, where the actual file lives in Google Cloud. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, and so these files live somewhere specific, uh, and, but all we need to do in Terra is reference where they live. We don't actually copy them to the workspace we can just point to where they live. So you can have multiple projects referring to the same data, pointing to the same data. You don't need to maintain multiple copies of your data. Um, and similarly, you can access other people's data uh, who give you access, assuming they've um, given you uh, credentialed access. Uh, you can use other people's data without having to copy it over and without having to pay for storage and maintain a copy of any other data that you want to work with. So anyway, I have these hundred um, exome BAMs. I can do anything I want on them. I'll show you what it's like to run a uh, workflow on these uh, BAMs. So in our study, what did we do? We made synthetic data, and that is uh, the first three, the first three workflows here in this list were the workflows we made to generate the synthetic data in the first place. Then the next one, that is uh, calling GHK haplotype caller to make a GVCF. Uh, and that's the individual per sample variant calling for germline short variants. Then number five here, the next one is across all of the, all of the GVCFs that we create, um, do a joint calling. So that's one workflow to do the joint calling across all the sample GVCFs. And that will give us our cohort BCF. And then finally, uh, we do the variant effect prediction with this other toolkit called Gemini. Um, so I'll show you the, the variant calling. Uh, so the variant calling in this case, it's one workflow where we have just the haplotype caller and a couple of related uh, functionality. Um, now by default, Terra doesn't show you the script because it assumes that you know what's in there and you just want to know how to run it. Um, but if you want, you can view it. And this, the, the code for the script is uh, also deposited in GitHub, so you can find it, it's version controlled. Um, but this is the actual script, uh, and we'll, we'll cover the mechanics of this, uh, of Whittle, in, in a lot more detail Friday morning. Um, but just to give you an impression, that's what it looks like. So this script is simply going to call haplotype caller per sample, and it's doing it in a way that parallelizes across regions in the genome to go faster. Because when you're in, in a setting like this where you have as many machines at your disposal as you want, you're not limited by the number of nodes in your cluster, um, you can just, we call it scatter, you can scatter the execution 
across uh, across many regions of the genome. Like you can you can treat all these regions as independent from each other, and so you can process them in parallel. And so our script is designed to do exactly that: to take in an interval file um, and to scatter across that. Uh, running haplotype caller is as simple as call a task call haplotype caller that has been defined separately and defines the command line that needs to be run and saying this is what I want you to do um, and after because the scattering creates an output file for every separate region that we ran we have a merge GBCF step that just takes all those output files and merges them back together um, and that's it so that's this script uh, that's the workflow part of the script and if you want to see what each task like that is being called does exactly um, you scroll down below and you find this is basically the command line uh, for GATK that will actually run the commands and again we'll go into more detail of the syntax and how it's structured on Friday but I wanted you to have just a, a high-level impression of, of what it looks like in practice okay so that's your script. Um, we're going to run haplotype caller to make some GBCFs. How do you actually run that in this particular system? We have it set up so that it already has pre-configured inputs. Um, and this form basically allows you to change those pre-configured inputs if you want. But by default, this is set to uh, if you look at the input BAM, this is going to be uh, the main input. Um, and this is set to point to the column in my data table that is called mute synth exome BAM. And I'm going to show you what that means. So it's going to say for any sample that I want to run this on, take that, the file that is in that column as an input value. Um, I could also just give it a direct input file path if you if I want but I like taking advantage of what we call the data model which is that table of data that has been set up because now I can just say um, select uh, from from the data that I have in my workspace I can say uh, let's just run on three of the samples to, to test I can just say uh, I want to run on these three first samples just as a test run of my pipeline before doing the whole job. Um, and I don't have access to my uh, button. Uh, oh yes, there we go. All right, so I selected my three samples and I've set up my, my tool to run on whatever value, whatever file is under this column. So for each of these samples that it's gonna run on separately, it's gonna take that, the corresponding input file as an input value. Um, and at this point, oh yes, the outputs, uh, by default, I can have it, have the system write the outputs so that uh, it will update the table with the corresponding files um, using this uh, particular syntax. And I can change that. If I change the name that's here in this field, it'll change under what column it writes the outputs. If the column exists, it'll overwrite whatever was there. Um, if I give it a new name of a column that doesn't exist, it will just create a new column uh, for my output file. I can save it. And at this point, I can just run the analysis. Launch it. And now I have three workflows running, um, each one the same pipeline running on the three different samples in parallel. And each one of those is parallelized for the haplotype color execution. And so now I have, I'm running this, this GATK pipeline on three exomes. And I could just easily, as easily select a hundred or thousands of the samples, and it just runs like that. So that's the basic uh, uh, execution for a workflow, and this is going to be queued for a little bit. Uh, well, it shouldn't be queued for very long because it just runs. Um, 
Sometimes there's a few minutes before it updates the status because what happens behind the scene, and I guess it's useful to understand that, what happens behind the scene is that my the metadata for what I just did, so what I just did, it sends the metadata to the Cromwell engine. So Dan told you about the Cromwell workflow management system. Um, there's a server that's running in the cloud all the time. So we send the data, we send the, um, the script that we want to run, and Cromwell is going to read that, uh, generate individual jobs based on that, uh, individual jobs that need to be executed, sends that to Google, and then that gets run on new machines gets provisions, it, it does all the analysis, then it'll write out the results back to my workspace bucket. Um, there's a few minutes overhead of, of getting all of that machinery set up. Is that a baby I hear crying? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, right, and so uh, sometimes it, it can take a few minutes to get going, but once it gets going, it's just going to run on the cloud and um, you just need to wait for the results to arrive. Uh, let's see, ah, I guess. Uh, I'm gonna refresh. See, now it's running um, and it, it'll take a little bit of time, so let me show you uh, something else and then hopefully by the time we get back, uh, because these are exomes, some of it might already have finished. Okay, um, so that's how you run a uh, workflow. The other thing, so to show you the, the list of workflows again, um, you have, I just started off the, the GPCF generation process. Once those are done, we'll do a joint calling across the GPCFs that are produced to produce the final VCF for the cohorts, and then we'll do the variant effect prediction. Now, we've actually already done this work um, for you and the, the results are already uh, in, in the system. So we have the original test cohorts that we ran on. We already have uh, run some of these steps. Except I don't think we ran, did we run it? Oh yeah, I guess we haven't done the varying calling on this one. Anyway, you can do it and if we have time, we'll step through these steps. Otherwise you can do it um, at home, basically the same, or at home or at work, I want to presume, uh, but you can do it by yourself. Uh, we have instructions in the workspace on how to do it by yourself. The other thing I wanted to show you is the notebooks part for interactive analysis, and that's what we're going to use for the next few days of the workshop for all of the practicals. We'll be working in notebooks. Um, who here has already worked with Jupyter Notebooks? Okay, so almost half the room. Um, they're a very convenient way to, uh, to share an analysis with a collaborator. Some people don't love working with notebooks for active analysis and development um, for legitimate reasons, but for teaching purposes and for sharing your methods, they're extremely convenient and I'll show you why. Um, and I realized I should have uh, show you that first. So here, the notebooks, if you're not familiar with them, um, I'll click this button real quick. If you're not familiar with Jupyter Notebooks, they're basically a, an environment, a system, uh, that allows you to have uh, to intermix text and executable code in the same document. Um, and it's very nice when you're trying to uh, share your, your work with other people because you can have some amount of text that's just describing uh, what your analysis is. Um, and then you can actually have these little pockets of code that are, that are executable. Um, and that allow you, once, once the system is ready, it allows you to actually run things um, and see the results just get generated in real time. And you can even edit and rerun things. And so 
it's it kind of goes beyond just documenting a script or documenting your code um, because it's it's fully portable you can you can distribute this um, and anyone can reproduce um, your work exactly and so that's what we did for the analysis that we've re-implemented we worked with uh, Mathieu Miosek, uh, one of the authors, um, to re-implement the analysis they had done in some custom scripts. Uh, we re-implemented it as a notebook. And so every step that's done as part of the analysis is in here. Um, now the first part of this particular notebook, there's a little bit of uh, kind of a utility code that allows us to work with Google resources. And we'll go over that in a bit more detail tomorrow um, when we introduce you in a hands-on way to using these tools uh, to run GATK commands. Um, but let's get to the actual analysis part. So here you can see the actual analysis that's captured in the notebook is what we did for the variant loads and cluster analysis parts. So we have, based on our 100 sample synthetic cohorts, uh, which is just a, a subset of the, the full synthetic cohorts for demonstration purposes, um, we bring in the, 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 the results file from the automated batch analysis. We bring that into the notebook environment. And at that point, we can apply any number of uh, of analysis commands that we want. And so, for example, in this case, we're looking at the output of that uh, Gemini tool, um, which is the, the functionally annotated variant call sets. We can apply, for example, a filter for this, this annotation, which is, uh, it, it's a score that describes how likely a particular variant is to be um, deleterious. Uh, to have an actual negative effect. And so you can filter and say, I only want to look at um, variants that are very likely uh, to have a negative effect uh, on the production, production of a protein. Um, once we have that, we can look at actual, the, the actual gene annotations. And so we can count, do something like count the number of variants per gene because we expect that the variant load in a given gene is going to be higher um, for a gene that is a real risk factor as opposed to something that is unrelated. Um, so we can find, uh, we can identify uh, specific genes that uh, for, when you normalize for length, um, are identified as having a higher variant load uh, than others. Um, and then there's some, uh, some additional functions that you can run that will test whether you have a clustering within certain genes of those problematic variants. You run that, and what that will produce ultimately is a set of tables. I'm not running it yet, um, and I'll explain in a second why, uh, but once you have that that table of uh, risk factors, you'll be able to identify specific, whether you have specific genes that are um, uh, predicted to be risk factors. Now we did that on a cohort of 100 samples, and then we did it again on 500 to kind of test um, how, how few samples we could use to, and still be able to demonstrate um, how the tools worked. Um, and we found that with 100, you, you actually pull out that, that gene, and it's called Notch1, the gene that I identified. But you can pull it out with 100 samples, of which I think eight are case samples um, for that particular um, gene. But the, um, you don't have strong confidence because you, you basically don't have enough statistical power with that small a number. But then you redo it with 500, you have much higher statistical power. Um, if you redo it with the full size cohort that they originally used, then uh, you have a very strong signal and you can pull that out. Uh, and basically what I'm showing you is that you have this, this complete re-implementation of the original analysis 
And instead of having it in a format of custom scripts that we couldn't use directly, this is something that we can share and anybody can reproduce it. And you can go in and use that on your own data um, and be able to uh, apply the same methods without having to do a lot of work to get it working on your computing system. So that's the basic idea. Um, are there any questions about this part? Then I want to talk a little bit about how, what the notebooks system is doing uh, in the background here. Um, when you start, and this is going to be important tomorrow, uh, when you start a notebook in Terra, what happens is that the system is going to request a virtual machine from Google and install everything that you need to run this uh, on that particular machine. Um, and then it's like it's it's like it's basically having a, a computer with those specifications available for you to work with interactively. Um, the nice thing is, and, and we'll demonstrate that tomorrow, is that you can change the specification of the machine. So, for example, you got a kind of a normal machine configuration. Uh, you're running a tool that requires a lot of memory, and you run out of memory while you're running it. You can, on the fly, go and change. Uh, there's a little, um, little option menu where you can decide that you want uh, to have like, additional uh, computing power. You can do it custom. You can say how many CPU, how much storage you want, how much memory you want. You can pretty much uh, adjust uh, what, based on what you need for your particular analysis. Um, and it also tells you how much it's going to cost you to use that particular machine because we are we do need to pay Google for that compute. Uh, but as you can see, on the order of twenty cents per hour, um, it's pretty darn cheap. And you can do anything you want with this machine for that amount of time. Um, okay, so my machine is finally re ready. Up to now, we were looking at it in read-only mode because it does take a few minutes to prepare the machine, to install the software that we requ uh, require, and so on. The nice thing is that during that time, you don't actually need to worry about doing any of that. It just it gets done for you. Um, and once it's ready, you can take advantage uh, of having that all set up. Um, so now we have the notebook in uh, interactive mode. And the way it works, and again, we'll use that tomorrow, is that you have these executable cells, called cells. Um, you can, uh, how do I do this again? Um, you, can, you, can run, um, you can run the code that's in a particular cell. You can edit it, but you can also request that it run. And so, you can step through somebody's analysis just by saying, run this and then run this um, in, in pretty much in the order as specified. And you can see that it's, it actually runs the code and gives you whatever console outputs. If it's producing figures, if it's producing tables, whatever, that will appear below the cell um, after you execute it. Uh, okay. And so kind of as you walk through this, um, it's going to, to do all the work that's in the analysis. At this point, um, I'm going to check back on my workflows. But first, I want to see on a scale of 1 to 10, who is super confused by this? Nobody, OK. Who is very comfortable with this idea now? OK, everybody else, tomorrow is going to be very useful <laughs> to clear everything up. So we'll, we'll use this uh, in practice tomorrow. Uh, but I'm glad to hear that nobody is super confused. Uh, and we'll get you all uh, very comfortable. And this is going to allow you to run the GHK commands. And all the tutorials that we provide um, will be done through this interface. And it will make, it'll make a ton of sense uh, when we do it. So let me, yeah, go ahead. If you haven't set up this account for Terra and you need help with that, don't worry. Tomorrow, before we start the tutorials, we'll spend 15 minutes just setting up mm -hmm. this Terra account and we'll walk through all the steps that you we started off with. Okay, so um, let me peek back at the uh, my jobs that were running there. Wait, 
No, don't make me do that. Um, oh, yes, yes. I can do this. Okay. Um, I will say uh, we're still in a beta phase where there's a few rough edges in the program. One of them is navigating back um, when you're like in a notebook or in the work in the job manager. Um, there's still a few a few rough edges in terms of easily navigating back to your workspace. The development team is actively working on that. Um, but we're at the point where the the core functionality, like running workflows and and doing work in notebooks, is uh, is pretty solid pretty robust and good enough for our purposes, um, which is why we're using it here. So, okay, so we did, uh, yes, I wanted to show you the job history. So we are still running. Um, uh, basically, my, my three, uh, oh, all right, all right, I'll sign in. Um, oh, what's up? Come on, job manager. Don't do this to me. Uh, I wonder if it's because of the... Oh, no, okay. I was just impatient. It's working. Okay, so um, this shows you... Uh, I can show you deeper in the details that I have... Uh, this is in my way. Um, it's basically... You just see above the, the little black bar at the bottom. I have 23 of the the shards, so I scattered my job in 24 regions, and there's because I'm doing it per chromosome actually, and there's 23 that are already done, um, and one of them that is still running. So I'm going to try to see if I can uh, drill down into that. Uh, I can't quite access the link, but um, I can show you. So, uh, did you say again? Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, but I'm 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 trying to. Oh, we don't have the scatter, the details of the scatter yet. When Sorry, I this is. When I suspect happens, it's it's actually kind of a feature. So one thing you can use. Google Cloud is, is called free applicable mm. instances, which are a fraction of the cost of normal reserved instances. And the, the trade off is that you could be running on a machine that disappears out from under you. So it, it might have to mm. start some jobs. But, but before that, you get a, you know, something like a third of the cost of the normal server. So it's a good way to save money. It's actually a fifth. It's 25, 20%, 20% cost. So the preemptible instances. Yeah, I think you're right that one of the one of the jobs was preempted, meaning the machine I was running on got taken away from me um, in the middle of run, so it has to do it again. Uh, the the reason we put up with that behavior is because it costs us 20% of the normal cost to use those kinds of machines. It's for for short running jobs, it's really worth it, um, and that's how we get. <coughs> We get the cost of our pipelines down a lot. Um, no, what I meant though, Dan, was I wanted to drill down into the details for the shards. Like I wanted to have the list of them, but that's not ready yet. I think, right? So we can't look at the status of the individual shards. But I can show you that um, if I follow the link to the execution directory, which is not normally something you need to do but I want to show you that the work actually got done. Uh, you see all the individual jobs that were done. Um, and for example, if I click on one of them, you can see that the GVCF for that particular one uh, has been generated. Um, you can find, if you're interested in seeing uh, the output log from, from the, the tool, you can find that in there. So you, you still have access to all of the information that GATK outputs. This is the, the console log that is produced by GATK when it runs. And so if you have run GATK before, it should look very familiar. If you have not, this is what it looks like. Uh, when, the G, when you run GATK on the command line, this is what it produces. Um, and so 
you can you you still have access to all of that if you if you want to if you need to have access to it so this it's not something that you normally need to have you can also see the the actual script that was run that was sent by Cromwell to get executed on Google and you can see the exact commands the exact command line that got run so you can confirm that yes you're running um, what you expect uh, so this is kind of a peek under the hood of what's happening, um, and it shows you that the, the jobs are being run as expected. Now, because there's that one job, are we all done? No. So I can't yet show you the full completed pipeline, unfortunately, which is what I was hoping to show you. Um, let me see if one of the others completed by any chances. Uh, not quite. They're, they're all still running, um, but they're probably close to being done. But we're going to run out of time. Uh, it was kind of a stretch to try to get that done uh, within this amount of time. But basically, um, we will have run the pipeline on all those three samples, and we would then be able to go to the next step in the analysis. And again, you'll run. The variant calling, um, the per sample, the joint calling across the full cohort, and then the effect prediction before going to the notebook. And that is typically how you would lay out, uh, kind of design the analysis for something like uh, this particular case study. All right, I think, I think we're good for today. I'll look a little bit tired. <laughs> Um, so how about we stop here so uh, you get you have a sense of what it looks like from start to finish tomorrow we will delve into the gory details of germline variant calling uh, with a mix of talks about how the algorithms work and some hands-on tutorials uh, so that you can get your hands on the actual tools thank you very much and I will see you bright and early tomorrow morning